conversation rather than Terrific. just talk. Yes, good. <laughs> good. Welcome to Q&A's. I'm your host, Marcia Boyles, and I'm delighted today to introduce the second in our series on low vision. I'm so pleased today to have Dr. Suleiman Alibi, who is the head of the low vision services that is in both uh, Bethesda and in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Alibi really has a reputation as being practically a saint among folks that have any low vision issues and, and I think many, many folks have heard of you and your services. So Dr. Alibi, you are, you are an optometrist and you specialize really in, in low vision issues and low vision assistance. Correct, correct. Tell us a little bit about your, your own background and about the services that your group provides. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me today. Um, the, the term low vision refers not to just people who need eyeglasses. This often gets to be confusing because people say, well, you're an optometrist. You must be providing people with eyeglasses and contact lenses. And once you do that, they can see well and continue with their lives. So this is a little different. This case, low vision refers to a chronic loss of vision. So after I completed my training in optometry, I went for a specialization in working with people who are visually impaired, and I did this training up at Johns Hopkins. They have a low vision center there, which is also involved in research. And we are trying to now help people who are visually impaired with chronic diseases of the eyes. And today in the United States, there are three big ones we always talk about macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts. Now, of course, cataracts mm -hmm. is one we can cure because people have cataract surgery and practically can restore their vision. But macular degeneration and glaucoma are not curable. And if I could add a fourth one, there is also something called diabetic retinopathy, which is really the result of long-standing diabetes in the eyes. And as we know, the population is getting more and more diabetes and mm -hmm. one of the consequences is to have retinopathy. So these conditions are treated and the patients I see are referred to me by retina specialists, by glaucoma specialists and even cataract specialists because despite their treatments they're still having difficulty seeing. And when I talk about difficulty seeing again I'm going to say they already have glasses, they already have contact lenses mm -hmm but they're still experiencing difficulty. So these are chronic conditions where they have a chronic loss of vision and now they're having day-to-day -day problems, whether it's reading their mail, recognizing a face, driving a car, setting the temperature on the oven, walking around safely, dealing with glare, and this whole issue of how does one who's visually impaired adapt now to living with vision issues and how does one develop strategies that enable them to stay independent and self-sufficient. Again, one of the confusions people have is that perhaps eyes are like other parts of the body, that ultimately we can just replace their eyeballs and they'll be seeing fine again. Oh my. You know, All that's right. that's always something mm -hmm. with modern medicine mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. do so much today. Everything is fixable. Right. People mm -hmm. assume everything is fixable. Mm -hmm. but vision is a sensory organ. It's almost a piece of your brain, if you like. So we don't have, contrary to what people think, we don't have eye replacements. We don't replace people's eyes. So when there is a chronic loss of vision, 
they have to undergo some form of rehabilitation, some way to learn to adapt and to make the best use, if you like, of the vision they still do have. Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for some of these conditions, the conditions are progressive, not necessarily leading to total blindness, but certainly progressive to the point that the day-to-day -day activities become more and more impacted. And although people might still be able to independently walk, they might not be able to independently read anymore. Yes. So we still have mm -hmm. to find ways for them to adjust, to adapt, and look for tools and strategies to enable them to stay independent and self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So that's what my work is about. It's really about mm -hmm. rehabilitation, helping people who are visually impaired find tools, ways, strategies, and means of staying independent. All right. Are your, are, are your centers in Alexandria and Bethesda fairly unique to this area? Um, optometrists have always been providing low vision of some form, even in their regular mm -hmm. offices where they provide eyeglasses and contact yes. lenses. But a whole office devoted to low right. vision? That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's unusual. Mm -hmm. That's unique. Most eye doctors tend not to specialize in rehabilitation simply because we don't have good reimbursement for these services. I see. All right. Now, does Medicare reimburse for most of these services? So Medicare reimburses me as though I'm providing an eye exam. I see. And Medicare doesn't make the distinction that it's vision rehabilitation and it's more of an extensive eye exam where we're looking at visual functioning rather than saying, here's a problem you have, let's do this and it's fixed and let's get on with the next patient. Yes. So th these visits take a lot longer. Historically, vision rehabilitation has been provided by society. So if we go back to the end of the Second World War, a lot of our veterans came back blind and visually impaired and the federal government set up programs to help them stay independent and so blindness and vision loss were considered part of a societal adaptation a social service program rather than a medical problem I see all right mm -hmm. and that's because during that mm -hmm. period we were, tra we were talking more about traumatic vision loss people coming back from a war yes. with traumatic vision mm -hmm. loss who really had now lost perhaps all their vision and needed to learn blindness rehabilitation strategies. The so this is where our seeing eye dogs and things of that Exactly. Sort. The use of mm -hmm. white canes, using braille, ah. and that total adaptation mm -hmm. to blindness rehabilitation was really born there. And even in the state of Virginia here, we have still have something called the Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. And they do provide on-site services. So I myself refer patients to the Department of the Blind and Vision Impaired who would come out to their homes, for example, and adapt the oven or the stove, or put lighting in the right places, or teach a person to walk with a cane if that was needed, or put braille markings and teach that person how to use braille, and also help sometimes in finding visual aids that might be useful. So it's always been a societal thing. So Medicare now provides reimbursement for the evaluation, but not for the tools and strategies that would be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so this low vision rehabilitation field is sort of an up and coming field because as the population ages is why we're ending up with more and more people with chronic vision loss. Like yes. I said, those conditions mm -hmm. of macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts are really disproportionately affecting older people, people over the age of 65. Do you have than any idea people. what kind of proportion we're talking about here in terms of the general population over 65? So the population, if we look at the population over 80, one third of them will have macular degeneration. And if we look at statistically, the, the slope increases almost exponentially as we go from 40 to 80 in terms of chronic vision loss. So it really, mm -hmm. when we talk about vision rehabilitation today, we really are talking about rehabilitating older people with chronic diseases of the eyes, yet rather than the younger people with traumatic vision loss, yes. which sadly still occurs, and mm -hmm. there are still mm -hmm. programs to help them mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. But for the older population, it's issues related to independent living. Yes. For the younger population, it may be related to continuing to be able to work, 
continuing to be able to be productive members of society. So the emphasis is slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. disproportionately, low vision rehabilitation today is the older population, mm -hmm. over 65, and mm -hmm. especially over 80. Mm -hmm. All right. Tell us the kinds of things you do. Okay. The first thing I do might seem a lot like an eye exam. A lot of the patients come to me and they look around and they say, well, this looks much like the eye doctor's office that I usually go to. And usually when you go to your regular eye doctor, a lot of the testing is done by technicians. A lot of the um, specialized tools are uh, that they use to test the vision done by technicians. And then finally the doctor comes in yes. and says, all right, well, this is what's going on. Here's what we're going to do. And then leaves. Here, here's your new glasses. Here's your new glasses. Yes. Are, yeah. Or here's the treatment we're going to try and mm -hmm. then leaves. Whereas in low vision rehabilitation, I'm with the patient from the beginning to the very end. First part is a very detailed history. Not so much about tell me what's your vision like, but more about how has the vision impacted you in your day-to-day -day life. I'd right. like to understand how is mm -hmm. this individual's real life impacted rather mm -hmm. than what they can mm -hmm. just see or not see. And so it's a more complex history where we look at where, what are their living circumstances. Are they living alone? Are they in a retirement community like this? Mm -hmm. Do they have somebody around who can help and substitute? Mm -hmm. Or are they completely having to rely on themselves? Mm -hmm. And in some situations, they're the primary caregiver. They may mm -hmm. have somebody who they're taking care yes. of, and yet they're having their own problems. So understanding this is, is very important to beginning this process. Mm -hmm. The vision exam is done much the same. It's still an eye chart. Most of the times on an eye chart, you're asked, read the best line you can see. The idea is to find out what's the threshold of your vision. When I'm examining patients, I want to know how well they can see what they can see. I'm not interested in whether they can reach the bottom line or not. I want to see, can they read the letters they see easily with an effort, or do they have to still concentrate? What's their functional vision? How easily are they reading this eye chart? We measure something called contrast sensitivity. Typically, eye charts are just black letters on a white background, but we know the real world is made up of all kinds of shades of gray. So somebody might do well with an eye chart, which is black and white, but not do well when they have to pour coffee in a black mug. So I measure contrast sensitivity, and surprisingly, sometimes people do very well on the black and white eye chart. They might even have 20-20 vision, but their contrast sensitivity can be so poor that they would never be able to pour coffee in a black mug accurately, or they'd have trouble recognizing a face or looking at the edge of steps and curves. So we take measurements of contrast. The next thing is reading. I think one of the biggest issues for people who have vision loss is independence with respect to reading. Now yes. that reading could be the newspaper, it could be their computer, it could be their smartphones, it could be the announcements on the wall if they're a place like this. And so Again, the reading is not done with just letters and saying, read me the smallest line of letters you can see, but reading sentences. And again, I'm reading to understand how easily can they read, how efficiently do they read. I often say to somebody, imagine you're reading your bestseller. You're in a, in, in a bookstore and you're about to do your book signing and 300 people have gathered here to listen to you read. And oftentimes people say to me, I'm so embarrassed. I feel like I'm a grade school reader. I, I've lost that fluency. Reading one by one by one. Exactly. Uh -huh, sure. So that one by one by one reading might be OK just to check a phone number. Right. Might be OK just to check a label. But it's no longer OK to do any meaningful reading, yes. a document in which they had to read carefully to make a decision on. Mm -hmm. So again, we an analyze their reading. And then I do examine their eyes, and I do an exam really again to understand how well does what I see in their eyes, if they have macular degeneration, if they have cataracts, if they have glaucoma, how well does the anatomy correlate with what I've just measured? Just to make sure there isn't any discrepancy there, because ah. sometimes there can be. Mm -hmm. And then I will test them to make sure that their glasses are accurate. And oftentimes people say, oh, my doctor said nothing more could be done to improve my glasses. And that's often true. And, but sometimes we do find that somebody has some uncorrected prescription. And even if it makes a little bit of difference, that might be just that little bit of edge that we need. Yes. 
So after checking for their glasses, we'll begin to introduce the rehabilitation strategies. And they basically fall into three simple categories. Adjustment of lighting, and for most people who are visually impaired, light is a double-edged sword. They'll need more light, but at the same time, light will cause a lot of glare. So helping them understand how to manipulate their environment to adjust for lighting, whether it's using special types of lamps, what types of bulbs, positioning of lighting. Um, at the same time, how to deal with the glare that comes from lighting, yes. using gooseneck lamps that could be placed below their eye levels, how to deal with glare outside, and yet keeping in mind this effect of contrast, because people who have loss of contrast have unusual glare sensitivity. So we've got to cut, cut out the glare, which most people think I should wear darker glasses, but that actually makes it harder to see in terms of contrast. So we still have to cut out the glare without reducing the contrast sensitivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this balance of lighting is something we spend a lot of time on. And then, like I mentioned, this word contrast. How do we manipulate our world so that if it's difficult to pour coffee in a black mug, well, I might suggest a white mug. There we have enough contrast, right? Some people complain, well, it's very difficult for me to sign a check now. Well, it may help to switch to a bold black felt-tip pen. Most people don't know that the bank even makes special bold contrast checks, which we call large print checks, it which have does. nice bold lines. Are they right. the same size as a regular check? They're even bigger. They're slightly mm -hmm. bigger than a regular mm -hmm. check, and they have a nice registry with thick bold lines where it's easy to see what oh. you're filling in. Mm -hmm. So even the simplest adjustments for contrast are helpful. Some people find certain colored filters help. So for example, people who've ever done any hunting or skiing will often use yellow and amber lenses. So some of my patients benefit from yellow and amber tints that we incorporate into their glasses. And then finally, we look at magnification strategies. And that's the biggest mm -hmm. part of this mm -hmm. whole thing mm -hmm. because... And is, the, is that for most eye uh, issues? That's for most size. eye issues, yes. Mm -hmm. Size is an, mm -hmm. is an issue. But for some people, they may have good resolution meaning they can still see 2020, but it may be they just need lighting and contrast strategies. Ah. For people with macular degeneration, typically they need magnification as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So then we begin to look at different ways of magnifying, whether it's glasses, whether it's magnifiers you hold in your hand, or there are now very sophisticated electronic magnifiers I as was well. going to say, now with, these new t with new tablets and e-readers, uh, where we can change the size of font, uh, is, is that one of your strategies? Absolutely. Primary absolutely. strategies? Mm -hmm. And that's a very useful strategy mm -hmm. because those tablets and e-readers are ubiquitously available now yes. and relatively inexpensive. So as long as somebody has no aversion to using technology and learning to use the technology, then I think these are very useful practical solutions mm -hmm. because you can get your emails on them and you can enlarge those, you can adjust for contrast. Carry them newspapers. around with you. Carry yes. them around with us, yes. I mm -hmm. think technology is working in our favor here and the availability of digital books is at least yes. helping counteract some of the needs for magnification which otherwise people had to carry a magnifier yes. or had to somehow enlarge standard print. Dr. Alibi, is there any way to, would there be any way to convert one's mail to an iPad or something of that sort? Is there any way to, to, to be able to externally read something and, and get it on your iPad? Well, a lot of banks and um, uh, utilities companies will provide you with a bill with that, a bill that's electronic uh -huh, now. Sure, so, sure. And, they, and your bank statements. Yeah, and, yes. and they, they're encouraging you to not mm. waste paper, and, right, and this right. makes it okay. easy for them, so, too. So uh, that's, that's through, one way. Uh, through Internet That's uh, through Internet. Access. Sure. But if, let's say, one had a letter from one's attorney, let's say, which your attorney has written you an important yes. letter. Yes, And it's very or difficult. Or the IRS. To, or the IRS, or God the, forbid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there are tools, there are machines called video magnifiers or closed circuit televisions in which you can place this mail 
under what looks like a computer screen, but it has a special camera in it, and it projects the image onto the screen. Now, I know here at Greenspring, you actually have these machines we have in the some library. We have old-fashioned ones, exactly. yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, the, yeah, and this technology keeps improving. Yes. There are even now optical character readers. As for some of my patients, magnifying creates so much magnification on the screen, they can only see a few words at a time. Mm -hmm. So it becomes awkward to try to read when you're basically seeing one word at a time. I guess. Well, these machines now have the capability of reading back to you. Verbally. Verbally, yeah. Uh -huh. So it's still a digital voice, uh -huh. mm -hmm. but at least mm -hmm. you can place the page under there. It scans it, essentially, and reads it back to you. So you can just yes. listen to what, what's and on And you know, there. a lot of the e-readers, not all of them, but a lot of the e-readers also um, have <coughs> audio exactly. capability. Exactly. Um, you always have that mm -hmm. option with any kind of mm -hmm. e-reader or mm -hmm. Kindle device. The, the uh, the readers, the magnifiers that Greenspring has, um, I, I just noticed uh, a few weeks ago, are the old-fashioned type that uh, they seem to only be in black and white, and they're the the they're they're not the flat screen type. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think we we probably could use some new uh, <laughs> some, <laughs> some new magnifiers here. Yes, why not? And the thing about this technology is that it keeps changing. So every six months. Does it keep improving? It keeps mm -hmm. improving. Mm -hmm. And not, it, it's, the irony here is it's not improving because there's so much awareness of vision loss and the companies are trying to help people who are visually impaired. This technology is being adapted from the sighted world. Yes. Just because mm -hmm. as the sighted mm -hmm. world ages, let's face it, um, the over 65 is the fastest growing segment of the population. Mm -hmm. The, that population also says, gosh, why do things have to be so small? How can I make them easier to see? And the technology lends itself well to that now. So the visually impaired world is now borrowing that technology and adapting it for its own purposes. And that mm -hmm. divide is becoming smaller and smaller now between what somebody who was sighted could do versus somebody who's visually impaired could do vis-a-vis -vis technology, vis-a-vis -vis computers and tablets and things. Are more and more people then getting their own devices, I mean, rather than using, for example, here in a, a communal device, getting more and more their own devices? Yes, I do find that's the case. And I think maybe it's two things. One is most people don't want to let on that they're visually impaired. And most of my patients, they have, may have macular degeneration, but if you looked at them, they get around normally, they look at mm -hmm. you eye to mm -hmm. eye, mm -hmm. but you don't really have a sense that they're visually impaired. So one, people don't want others to know necessarily. So if you're sitting in a public place using these machines, then of course right. it becomes obvious. Right. And secondly, it's just that issue of privacy. There may be things that you want to read in the privacy of your room. And convenience, um, rather than having to go to the lobby for every piece of mail you get. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So for that purpose, people tend to want to have their own things. But some of this technology is still expensive. A machine that magnifies mm -hmm. and reads the page out to you and has a nice flat screen is probably between two and three thousand mm dollars. -hmm. May not be affordable mm -hmm. for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and they now make small portable versions of that. So oh, instead of the old-fashioned magnifier with a mm -hmm. light in it that we would mm -hmm. all carry in our pocketbooks, mm -hmm. there are mm -hmm. electronic magnifiers and they run between six hundred and a thousand dollars. Now how do those work? They work on the same principle. All of this technology works on the basic principle of there's a small camera, a digital camera essentially, that's projecting the image on a screen. Ah. It's just that this flat screen technology that you refer to has become small, flatter, and thinner. Mm -hmm. Again, not because the visually impaired people demanded it, but those of us using cell phones right. demand it. Exactly. And, so that and it was available. <laughs> yeah, and so the mm -hmm. technology has been adopted. Mm -hmm. Just like you see the cameras on the cell phones today are so good that it re they're almost yes. replacing conventional cameras. Yes, absolutely. So that same little camera mm -hmm. now is capable of producing very high quality, high resolution images on these very nice flat screens, which are also very high quality. And that's why this technology is becoming more and more accessible. So Dr. Alibi, when, when somebody comes to you then after you've done the evaluation and got some sense of not only the status of their, their site, but also their lifestyle and, and what their needs might be, 
do you recommend then specific kinds of devices to for them to to try? Mm -hmm, that's right. So we'll often come up with a number of strategies, you know, mm -hmm. and again addressing it from those three standpoints of lighting, contrast, and magnification. I will have probably at the end of the evaluation said now try using the following types of lights and bulbs and try adjusting your lamps in the following way like I gave you the example of get the large print checks yes there are there are also other large print things that are available like books that come from the library and then whatever magnification aids are necessary I might might prescribe for them but I find the most difficult part about this is not so much the ad adoption of these strategies but it's the emotional adjustment that people have to make to being visually impaired ah. because they're still not seeing like they used to. They're still not doing things as easily as they used to. All of these things we've talked about are really crutches. So if I offer you a crutch or mm -hmm. I offer you a cure, one would much rather take yes. the cure, of course. Yes. So for many people, there's still a sense of disappointment, a sense of, well, I'm glad to know all these things exist, but emotionally, I still feel very upset about losing my sight. And even a lot of studies have shown that, for example, in the elderly population, the incidence of depression is much greater in people who've lost vision. I guess as we age, we can accept that we may walk slower, we may have weaker arms and hands, but we hoped that we would sit in our comfortable libraries and read all those books we've accumulated yes. over yes. the years, that we hoped we would still be able to recognize our faces and socialize easily. So there is a huge emotional and psychological aspect of dealing with chronic vision loss. And how do you deal with that? That is very, that is very difficult. And it's like any, anything that we lose, like losing a loved one, we go through various stages. In the beginning, we have the sense of denial that mm -hmm. this is happening. If you tell mm -hmm. people you have macular degeneration, mm -hmm. for example, they'll go, no, I think I'm fine. I can see. I can do everything. There's a sense of anger. A lot of people are upset that their doctors don't have better cures and treatments. You know, mm -hmm. people often say to us, well, if you can put a man on the moon, I just heard somebody ah. had their heart replaced. I've had a new, ki a new um, kidney or a hip, hip done. Or, uh -huh. What do you mean you, you, can, you can't you, fix you this? You can't fix this. So mm -hmm. there is that anger. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a prolonged period of depression. Just mm -hmm. like when you lose someone, you have mm -hmm. to go through that stage of where people feel down. They become isolated. A lot of people mm -hmm. do become very isolated mm -hmm. once they lose their vision. They're unable to drive, for example, mm -hmm. so that isolates mm -hmm. them. They're unable to socialize well because they don't recognize people, so that's very isolating. Mm -hmm. They're unable to read their newspapers like they used to. So again, they're isolated from the news of the world, which they were used to re reading certain editorials mm -hmm. in the Washington mm -hmm. Post, perhaps. And only after a while do they finally come to that stage of acceptance where they finally understand where the limitations are, they understand the limitations of what modern medicine is going to be able to do, and they understand their own limitations based on their vision that they're mm -hmm. going to have to learn to live with, that finally these strategies become incorporated into their daily lives and they do begin to use them effectively enough to once again feel like they can enjoy life, quote unquote, enjoy life. Um, and so a lot of the patients I see who come back to see me, we're often dealing a lot with that. Is Do you talk a good bit with patients about that particular mm -hmm. aspect of all Absolutely. of this? Absolutely. So in the beginning mm -hmm. when I take a history, mm -hmm. I try to figure out how are they coping? What stage mm -hmm. along this mm -hmm anger, depression, denial are they on, mm -hmm. and how ready, how willing are they to accept that they're now going to have to do things a different way. Yes. Patients still come to see me expecting I'm going to give them a pair of glasses mm -hmm. that their doctor couldn't give them is going to fix their vision and they can get on with life. Well, I think the very fact that you're acknowledging this reality with, with a patient must be extremely helpful. Um, I mean, I, I, I had no idea you were going to say that. <laughs> um, 
Dr. Alibi, I see that our time is coming to an end here. I, I can't tell you how appreciative um, I am and I think our audience is going to be for all the things you, you have shared with us today. Um, again, I think looking at the patient as a whole person um, is just so critical. And when I say I, I had no idea you were going to say this, I really, I mean that. I knew you were going to talk about strategies mm -hmm. and devices, but I think this acknowledgement is extremely important. So again, many thanks for coming. My pleasure. Um, and we will be sharing uh, this CD, as I told you, with the Low Vision Group as well. So. Wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next month.